are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. My next guest is a longtime activist, author, uh, and public speaker uh, on matters of war and peace and foreign policy. Medea Benjamin is the co-founder of Code Pink, and her latest book, which she co-authored with Nicholas J.S. Davies is entitled The War on Ukraine, How to Make Sense of a Senseless War. And she she joins us now. So first of all, Medea, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Richard. Nice to be on with you. Nice to have you. Um, so I guess the obvious first question is why this book? Why now? Once Russia invaded Ukraine and we started seeing how this war was progressing, uh, we were horrified. And my co-author, Nicholas, and I have been writing about foreign policy issues together for years. Uh, we had written about Ukraine. In fact, just a couple of weeks before the invasion, we laid out our projected scenarios. And the third and least likely scenario was a Russian invasion. So uh, we were certainly wrong on that count. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were horrified and felt like, uh, unfortunately, this was going to be a long war and that it was important to give people an understanding of how this happened. Uh, you know, there's an old saying about how Americans learn geography through war. And unfortunately, there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, we wanted people to not only learn where Ukraine is, but what is the context. And particularly as U.S. citizens, we wanted to lay out what the role of the U.S. and NATO has been in building up to this, not as a way to excuse the invasion, but a way to understand it. And if you don't understand the history and the context, you can't project the solutions. Well, I think that last part is, uh, last sentence is so important, Medea, because I think that, you know, there's a strong reaction, even among uh, progressives in this country, um, a, a, that I, I find hard to deal with, and, and I don't know exactly how to respond to. And basically, I would summarize it as it doesn't matter what happened before. It doesn't matter what the U.S. or NATO's or anybody else's role has been in, uh, you know, exacerbating the problems here or what have you. Uh, it's a black and white situation of right and wrong, and let's not muddy it with all this history. And uh, I find myself up against that quite a bit, and I imagine you do too. And uh, I'm just wondering where that fits into you, uh, this book and your conversations around the book and so on. Well, working backwards from today, if you don't think the role uh, the West had any role in this, you might be under the illusion that the uh, Ukrainians, if we give them enough weapons, can win back every inch of Ukraine, uh, that all of the Donbass would become Ukraine, that Crimea would become Ukraine. And then your uh, logical conclusion is we just got to keep sending an end endless flow of, of weapons. If you understand that this is a conflict that's go been going on for a long time, that there are a lot of ethnic Russians, Russian speakers in Ukraine, uh, that the West has been surrounding Russia and uh, creating a, a insecurity among the Russian state, and that the um, uh, 2014 Maidan uh, uprising had a lot of Western and particularly U.S. interference, um, then you begin to understand a little more from uh, the Russian side. So uh, there is a not a, I go back to saying, uh, I think we can join other people in saying that there is a no legal just justification for this war. Uh, there is no moral justification for, for this, this war. war. Uh, but it was a provoked war. It was a war that could have been prevented. And the tools and even some of the framework uh, that was in prior uh, peace agreements, like the Minsk II agreements, are there to be re, uh, 
uh, dust it off and, and lift it up uh, if only there is the political will to do that. And, uh, you know, first of all, I should say your book is it's short it's not you know people shouldn't be intimidated by the prospect of reading it but extremely informative very clearly written um provides a lot of great context including things you know i've been trying to track this pretty closely including things i didn't know um but i i think that it, I'm still struggling with this question of uh, when we talk about the origins, for example, the fact that uh, the Russians were promised uh, we would never uh, turn frontline states, states on their borders into NATO countries. You get into, And then I want to get into some of the specifics of the book, but you get the argument, well, but every country has the right to decide for itself. And I think uh, when you start to untangle that and realize, well, you know, their democracy has been interfered with it and so on. Um, I, I'm sorry to keep fixating on this, Medea, but since uh, my audience is largely progressive, I'm, I'm trying to address, before we get into the details of the book, the objections that progressives in specific uh, raise, for example, to the idea of negotiations, to the idea of uh, exploring other solutions, that kind of thing. Well, sometimes people can get a better understanding if you make the analogy of uh, something like what if Mexico decided it wanted to go into a military alliance with China? You know, would the U.S. allow that to happen? Um, so, you know, that kind of thing some people can relate to. Um, the other issue that you hear a lot is that you can't negotiate with Putin. And I think you were alluding to that as well. Right, Richard? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I think there are a number of answers. One, let's try. So let's see what mm -hmm. happens if, if uh, Anthony Blinken starts talking to Lavrov or Biden starts talking to Putin. Let's see if there's something on the table that the U.S. wants to put forth and see what the Russians answer to it is. Uh, the other thing that I think is useful for people to understand is that while there haven't been uh, negotiations that have been successful for stopping this war, there have been negotiations around particular issues that have had some success. For example, getting the International Atomic Energy Agency into the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Uh, for example, uh, getting the civilians out of Mariupol uh, and creating this corridor for them to leave. Uh, for example, uh, creating a corridor, both uh, land as well as sea, for more grain to be exported from Ukraine to the countries that so uh, desperately need it. And then there have been uh, actually probably about 16 prisoner swaps uh, that have happened. And you can imagine how difficult it is to do a prisoner swap logistically and the kind of trust that has to be created uh, to do that. And there have been some that have included hundreds of soldiers on each side. Uh, so those things have been negotiated. Uh, and the other thing is to go back to the negotiations that were happening just a month after the war began, where Turkey was mediating at the end of March, beginning of April, and where there was a proposal put forward by Russia that the Ukrainians looked very favorably upon. And Zelensky himself went to talk to the uh, public of, of, of uh, Ukraine saying that our uh, goal here is peace. And he also said that uh, we understand now that uh, Ukraine is not going to be a member of NATO. That is a dream we had, but we have to put that aside. Uh, and when uh, uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, went and met with Zelensky. And then we have Secretary of Defense from the US, Lloyd Austin, going. We see a sudden change because their message was, don't negotiate with Ukraine. We'll be here to uh, fight it out, to give you the, the means to fight it out uh, until victory. And as Lloyd Austin uh, said himself, that we need to weaken Russia. So things change very much there, but the fact that there were negotiations that were moving forward uh, in a positive direction should give, give people the sense that um, negotiations are possible. And one last thing I would add, Richard, is that this war is definitely not going the way that Putin and other 
uh, right. Russian military people thought it would go. And uh, they are uh, in a difficult situation. And even though the sanctions imposed by the West are hurting the West more than Russia so far, uh, it's going to start affecting the people in Russia as well. And we already see growing opposition inside Russia, especially when they were calling up 300,000 more uh, soldiers. Uh, so, you know, Russia uh, and, and Putin in particular, uh, who wants to hold on to his power, um, really does need to negotiate. Uh, and if it's not negotiations, then he's going to be backed in a corner. And that's where the use of nuclear weapons becomes more likely. And so do we want that? Uh, I think it's important to recall at this time when the it's the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, how John F. Kennedy not only negotiated with Khrushchev uh, and, and made compromises, uh, what the U.S. public rarely hears on that compromise was not only for the Russians to remove their missiles, but the U.S. removing missiles from Turkey. Uh, but what JFK said was, uh, be very careful when you are confronting a powerful nation with nuclear weapons that you don't push them into making having to uh, make a choice between a humiliating defeat and the use of nuclear weapons. And that's exactly what the West, Biden, uh, NATO are, are doing right now to Putin. Uh, and it's very scary and is a reason why we must negotiate. And, you know, uh, to that point, Medea, it, it uh, you know, the uh, the president at one point, the United States president said at one point, you know, Putin's got to go. Apparently, you know, his, his people disavowed that. Uh, people talk about creating, a, using this opportunity, quote unquote, uh, at Ukrainian expense to um, force Putin out of power. But what it seems to me increasingly clear is that we're part Putin to be removed from power, uh, there's every likelihood that a more warlike, you know, we saw this uh, in the retaliation for the, uh, you know, blowing up the bridge, it, it is that he is under pressure from even more warlike factions within his own government and among his own generals. So the idea that uh, you know, a Russian military coup or some other sort of let's get Putin out would be good for world peace is seems to me to be uh, at best an extremely risky bet, if not downright destructive. That's right. And you also always have to be careful what you wish for, because uh, we could get a more hardline leader in uh, replacing Putin. And there could also be extreme chaos uh, that could really destabilize the region even more. Uh, I think we have to um, stop this idea that we can uh, re-engineer the government in Russia. That is up for the Russian people to do. Uh, and maybe with this disastrous war, uh, they might just go ahead and do that. Uh, but whenever it's imposed from the outside, as we've seen in U.S. attempts to do so in many other instances, the result is disastrous. Absolutely. You, you know, there was a fascinating uh, uh, fact in your book that I think uh, shed some light on this whole, you know, people say, oh, I don't know how many times I've been called, you know, a Putin lover or a Putin puppet when I, you know, I think he's a war criminal, but uh, he's needless to say, not my kind of guy. But uh, this reflexive, you know, Putin puppet or whatever, uh, this sort of uh, cartoon demonization of Putin. Some of, one of the interesting facts in your book, and I, I'll, I'll read from it, uh, Russia did not interfere in U.S. wars uh, at, at the end of the 20th century or, in, or during the early parts of Putin's uh, presidency and even provided logistical support and resupply routes for U.S. forces in Afghanistan. In other words, logistically and in other ways, Putin was actually to the right of you and me because we were against those, you know, but Putin was actually providing military support to the very national security establishment that's trying to destroy him. Now, you were, uh, you and your, uh, 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 Mr. Davies, then, right, not until 2007 at the Munich Security Conference did Putin begin to publicly challenge NATO expansion. And you go on from there, but, but, 
it seems to the, it seems to me the importance of that is to say that you know far from being a madman uh, you know i think very few world leaders are you know wonderful people but far from being a a, ma a madman who's born uh, with the desire to destroy the united states that there were factors that changed not only russia's relationship with the united states but vladimir putin's specifically so to deny that other factors can change them in other ways including negotiations it seems to me is uh, is a kind of blind leading the blind into a cycle of war do you get what i'm driving at well yes and i think you also brought up uh how in the past russia has worked with the united states military um, we might add on to that uh, the way that the russians have worked with the uh, us the french the germans to come up with the iran nuclear deal and it's quite ironic when we talk, uh, when we hear uh, that you can't uh, believe, you can't negotiate with Russia because uh, you'll never know if they'll keep their word. Well, many people around the world look at the United States like that and said that these other countries negotiated a, a, a nuclear deal with Iran, and then the U.S. pulled out of the very deal that it had signed. So how can you trust the United States uh, in these kinds of things? And then there's also the fact that the U.S. and Russia have negotiated arms reduction deals, uh, deals for reducing uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so, yes, there is a, a history of it. And as you said, uh, that changed quite dramatically when the U.S. position towards Russia changed. And it started to be uh, the, the goal of the United States to really encircle Russia uh, and find ways to weaken Russia. You know, let's talk for a second, Medea, about the personality or the the individual that is uh, Zelensky, because so much of the U.S. discussion around the war in Ukraine is centered on the idea: let's let's take leadership and direction from Zelensky. Let's quote unquote give Zelensky what he wants. That's a big piece of uh of the debate that i hear anyway and yet a couple things strike me about it both from your uh, book and otherwise the first is that it seems to me that when zelensky first approached this country after the invasion after russia invaded he asked for two things he asked for military support and the ability to negotiate because he can't negotiate away u.s sanctions against russia for example so he asked for two things but immediately people started saying give zelensky what he wants meaning military support not negotiating support and as your book highlights i already knew this about zelensky but your book provides a lot more information about you know he was an entertainer he uh a russian speaking ukrainian which is not insignificant in this context my grandparents were also russian speakers they were citizens of russia but it's ukraine now so um I guess my point being, Zelensky came in as a peace candidate, right? And he had very uh, progressive ideas about the kind of deal to work with, uh, 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 the kind of ways to work with Russia, to negotiate with Russia, to you know, in terms of Donbass and other disputed regions. Uh, and somewhere along the line, he has become increasingly hard line you mentioned he, he he crafted a tentative deal in uh march april boris johnson went over there there are those who feel johnson you know vetoed the deal on the part of the so in the u.s and its allies whatever happened it, it went away uh defense secretary talked about the war using the word weak in russia and so uh, and now zelensky seems to be it, it, it negotiations off the table completely he's asking for more and more weapons no limit uh and uh, i'm just wondering what you think's going on there with this guy who has become at least in american eyes the the entire linchpin of this war 
Yes, as you said, he he ran on a peace ticket. He was going to make peace in Donbass. He was going to implement the political sides of the Minsk II agreement that had never been implemented, which was to uh, meet with the leaders of the breakaway republics, to uh, allow uh, internationally supervised elections to take place there, uh, to uh, craft their uh, autonomy. And as soon as he tried to do that, just like the previous president, he was attacked by the extreme right in his own country, who even threatened to hang him from a tree. So we talked about the right in Russia uh, pushing Putin. Well, that is certainly happening in Ukraine as well. And I um, think that we have to recognize that as a factor in this, uh, in pushing uh, Zelensky to take a harder and harder position. But I still do think that if the United States and the Western countries said, you know, this is just getting out of hand, a nuclear war is is a real possibility, uh, we can't afford to keep pouring in these tens of billions of, of dollars, our people are starting to suffer the consequences of the uh, rising energy prices and the inflation. Uh, there has to be a solution to this. He would change his mind because the only reason that he can take this very hard line now is that he's got the Western backing with unlimited supplies of weapons. So, uh, and let's talk now, uh, Medea Benjamin, uh, about uh, Victoria Newland and uh, who she is and her role in this. Bearing in mind, if you're going to quote her verbatim, uh, we are on broadcast radio and therefore must be FCC compliant in our use of language. But um, who is Victoria Newland? She is someone who's had a very sordid history in this uh, uh, various episodes in Ukraine and certainly extremely uh, powerful when the popular uprising started against a very unpopular president but Demo but elected pr president uh, that that um, started to turn into a uh, armed rebellion uh, she stepped in to decide as assistant secretary of state who would come to power next and while the Europeans were negotiating uh, with the Ukrainian officials about some kind of new election and some uh, nonviolent transfer of power, she was working with the more violent factions and uh, figuring out uh, who was the U.S. Uh, uh, preferred, not candidate, because there were going to be no elections, who was going to be put in. Uh, and when you talk about the bad language she used, she was referring to the European Union. Now, it's important for people to understand that part of the uprising was about uh, whether Ukraine was going to be leaning towards the West and joining the European Union or leaning towards Russia and join in with commercial economic alliance with Russia. And while Yanukovych, who was in power, was negotiating both of these at the same time, uh, he did not sign a deal with the EU uh, because he thought that some of the uh, measures in there were not favorable enough towards Ukraine. And that angered people who wanted to be part of the West. When they rose up, uh, that's when Victoria Newland got involved. And she said, despite the fact that uh, the issue of whether uh, Ukraine was going to join the EU, EU or not was important. We're not going to let those damn EU people determine who is going to be the next leader of Ukraine. The United States will design that. And so there she was in the plaza in Maidan giving out sweets while in the back rooms she was determining who would be the leader of that country. And it is so ironic, Richard, that with the years of Russiagate, we heard about all the interference of Russia and U.S. elections and how that made the difference between Hillary Clinton losing and Donald Trump winning. Um, there was the U.S. actually handpicking the next leader of Ukraine. Well, and the U.S., of course, uh, had a hand in picking uh, Boris Yeltsin or getting him back into power. And Boris Yeltsin had a hand in picking Vladimir Putin, if I remember correctly. Um, so here we have 
Zelensky. See, I wonder to what extent y y your book uh, describes uh, a war on Ukraine, describes a lot of forces in play on Zelensky, right? As well as, so I'm wondering to what extent the U.S. is looking to him as the leader of this effort and to what extent he's you know doesn't want to get assassinated by the neo-nazi azov battalions to what extent he knows that if the u.s pulled all military aid uh, precipitously catastrophic things would happen um i i wouldn't want to be in his shoes for sure but i i wonder you know, or does he think that because there have been some military victories that does he have some real belief that he can defeat Russia militarily and reclaim the territories that uh, that Russia has taken, which, you know, our audience ought to understand the people there might not choose to go you know they there has been no referendum there so and many of them are you know russian speakers and so on but i'm you know i'm wondering to what extent he's an actor and to what in this drama and to what extent he's being acted upon if you get what i'm asking i think it's all of the above and as wars progress the sides harden uh, people become more ready for revenge, more hate develops. I mean, he's seen a lot of horrific things that have happened to his people. Yeah. And I'm sure that creates a sense of, you know, we don't want to compromise. We, we just want to uh, beat these bastards. Um, you know, and and, and uh, so I think all of the factors that you mentioned, as well as the one I just mentioned, are part of it. But I go back to saying that in the end, he doesn't have perhaps the ability to um, keep fighting without the West. Now, I say that perhaps because you can look in other instances like Afghanistan, right. where the Taliban didn't have massive amounts of weapons coming in from the outside. Uh, they just were steadfastly determined to uh, keep uh, taking weapons from the enemy and keep the fight going. There are some in Ukraine who say now that their largest support uh, supply of weapons is coming from the Russians when they flee the, the areas they occupied. So, you know, maybe the Ukrainians could continue fighting without the influx of uh, Western weapons, but it's doubtful. So in the end, while the U.S. wants to hide behind Zelensky, and say that we can't possibly tell him what to do, uh, it is the U.S. that is pulling the strings. The U.S. is pulling the strings in NATO. The U.S. is pulling the strings with, with Zelensky. And uh, the U.S. will have to negotiate with Russia in addition to Ukraine having to negotiate with Russia. As you said earlier, Ukraine is not able to uh, lift the sanctions or get a guarantee of lifting the sanctions that has to come from the u.s and if there is any compromise anything that russia can get out of this to save face it's going to have to include a lifting of at least um, some of these sanctions and only the u.s is able to do that so do you see uh any way out for uh let me place uh, phrase this a little differently Medea. um what would the wise course of action for the united states be right now it would be to send blinken to meet with lavrov and have them meet on a regular basis every single week to be talking 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 uh, it would be to bring in other outside leaders who, who can have an influence on the Russians, uh, whether it's the Chinese, the Indians, the Secretary General, uh, the Pope, who has been very, very good in this, uh, and to keep the talks going and keep several uh, negotiations going between U.S. and uh, U uh, Ukraine and Russia, push for them to talk, but to be talking directly to uh, Russia itself. I think that is reasonable. Uh, you know, the during the years of Vietnam, there were constant peace talks going on while the fighting was still happening. So if we can't reach a, a ceasefire to move to talks, well, let's just start those talks right now. 
And there are always ways to gain more trust. I mentioned some of the negotiations that had happened for prisoner swaps and uh, around the nuclear plant. Well, there are other issues that could be negotiated and uh, solved in the meantime while we were solving the larger issues. But in the end, are the American people really all that concerned where the border is in Donbass? Right. Uh, I think they've been led on to believe that this is some kind of security threat to the United States, but it isn't. There is one war going on that's a European border war, uh, a war between Ukraine and uh, people inside Ukraine who side with Russia and the Russians. But then there is the geopolitical war where the U.S. has been the aggressor and there. Uh, the U.S. has to talk directly with Russia and has to bring the NATO countries along. And one thing I would add to that, Richard, is that uh, in the early days of this war, there were certain leaders in Europe from Germany, France, and Italy who wanted to see a negotiated solution and were talking to Putin. But that was disregarded, and the U.S. managed to bring them all in line and show a unified opposition to Russia and a unified opposition to talks. Well, the winter is coming on. The prices of, of heating oil are going to be horrific for people uh, across Europe. Uh, the prices of the gas pump are going to be horrific. And there are going to be more protests as there are starting to be now. And unfortunately, it is the extreme right in those countries and perhaps here in the United States that's going to take advantage of that discontent. So I think there's going to be a lot more pressure as winter sets in to find a way to negotiate. And is there, I guess, last question, my dear Benjamin, but is there, uh, you see any path towards creating the political space for that in the United States? Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, I've seen more polarization around this issue and, uh, you know, I won't go into that anymore except to say uh, finding the political space for that has uh, especially, you know, among Democrats, since Democrats are currently in power, uh, you see a path forward for that? Well, this really uh, goes back to what I said, is as things get fo go forward and Americans are being hit more at the pocketbook by the inflation uh, that is uh, a consequence of this war, uh, there is going to be more pressure on Biden. I've been walking the halls of Congress on a regular basis. I just came back right now for your interview. Uh, the meetings that we're having are very disheartening because the Congress people, as you say, especially in the Democratic Party, are just stuck on this idea the more weapons we give them, then they can win this war. Uh, when, uh, But it's really, I think, they don't want to be seen as deviating from right. a Democratic president during an election time. So I think once November is open, they'll, it's over, uh, the elections are over, we're going to see a lot more possibilities. And I encourage anybody who's uh, watching, listening to this, uh, that they do contact their congressperson as uh, d disappointing as it is, as um, uh, as uh, uh, cynical as we might feel towards those who are supposed to represent us, we have to call them. And one of the reasons that there were 57 Democrat uh, Republicans who voted against the $40 billion package to Ukraine is that they said they were hearing from their base. So we have to hear, uh, the, uh, the Democrats have to hear from their base as well. Well, excellent note to end on. And again, my guest is Medea Benjamin. Her new book with Nicholas J.S. Davies is entitled The War on Ukraine, How to Make Sense of a Senseless War. I recommend the book. And so, Medea, thank you for writing it. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me on. Great to be with you, Richard. And you too. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.